Hey, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii Studios for another episode of Security Matters. Uh, today, we're talking about Corona crime. Uh, we're, we're interested to see if things have changed a little bit with this lockdown. Um, and I've got a couple of guys with me here that know this industry. They know this community very well. Uh, Michael Kitchens is with us today. Thanks for visiting, Michael. Uh, he's got um, stolen stuff Hawaii. I, I think uh, Mike tells me you have uh, some hundred plus, 150,000 followers over there. So this is something that's of interest to everyone. Thank you for serving the community that way. And I have Mike Gonzalez here. He's the Director of Technology for Integrated Security Technologies. Um, and he's, got, he's going to go over the CAP index and some of the crime reports. And we're kind of interested to see if some of the stuff that's, that's coming out of the CAP is maybe similar to some of the stuff you're seeing with your traffic over there, Mike. Um, so I'll let Mike Kitchens go first. Please um, introduce yourself to our audience. And uh, you know as much of your background and history as you care to share that leads up to, the, um, uh, to running the site that you run today. Of course, my name is Michael Kitchens. I run Stolen Stuff Hawaii. It's something I started in uh, 2014, and it came from a very small group into the Hawaii's largest anti-crime group. We have over 133,000 people and growing. Um, it's been an extremely effective tool in helping to not only uh, deter crime, but actually help find those responsible for it, as along with, with a, a whole number of other things such as uh, lost and found, you know, missing persons and uh, things like that. So we have a really good, uh, good time on it. We've been able to do a lot of good and we actually can see trends in, in what's going on. So obviously the current situation is, is rather interesting. That's awesome. Thank you. And uh, Mike Gonzalez, give us a little bit of your history there, sir, and then um, how you arrived here today. And this, the, tell us about this CAP index stuff too. Sure. My name is Mike Gonzalez. I'm the Director of uh, Technology for Integrated Security Technologies. I've been in the security field for roughly around 20 years. Pre previous to that, I was uh, in the military as an uh, infantryman uh, in the Army. Uh, after that, I went into doing infrastructure security for uh, a major electrical utility in the islands. I did that for about 10 years and learned a lot about the security industry and the threats that uh, that face various different sectors. Uh, one of the things that I've been interested in uh, during this uh, coronavirus shutdown is how that affects the crime statistics that we can usually see. And what I usually use as part of uh, security uh, threat and vulnerability assessments for client sites, we, we do mostly commercial and critical infrastructure and military, is uh, I use the Crimecast model. It's a, it's a website, capindex.com. What it does is it uh, consumes all the uniform crime reports coming in from the FBI and uh, all of the local police departments all over the country, they report um, UCR data, uniform crime report data to the FBI where it aggregates and then it's consumed by cap index and they put it down on a map using, using geospatial tools. So what you end up with is the ability to see over the past year or whatever time frame that you're looking for, um, what the crime statistics were in that neighborhood and how that compares to the national average. So uh, we'll, we'll show in some graphics here in a little bit about that. I think it's very interesting and uh, it, it ties into what Mike's doing on the internet pretty well. Uh, the people on his site, they report various different crimes, they report suspicious people, do these sorts of things. Mike always requires them to have a, uh, have a uh, police report number on there just to make sure that it's on the up and up. And uh, we can compare that. What I like to do is I like to get those crimes that I see that are of interest to me uh, and to our community. I check the CAP index data and I check the HPD Crime Stats website to, uh, to see if that's part of a series or if it's part of a one-off, or I'm interested to see if there's any sort of organization um, in that or if it's just randomized. So it's, it's a kind of a side thing that I like to do. That's awesome. And uh, Michael Kitchens, on, on your side of the house over there, do you compile statistical data alongside the, the sharing of the information that you're putting out with the community? I know it's um, I know you've got several different platforms and I was kind of wondering if you do you correlate those across or do you just tend to see threads in, in multiple places? Uh, I, I wouldn't. 
I wouldn't say that we take a statistical database. It's very difficult with the way Facebook works. Um, we had something oh, going, okay. and then everything went to Facebook, and that kind of hosed it, it all. But um, uh, really, what we do is we try to see trends. You know, uh, it's very easy for us to see trends if there's a specific type of, for example, vehicle that's being stolen. Uh, you know, if there's a specific area that's being hit hard, you can see these trends just by, you know, doing quick searches, by seeing, you know, the, the different posts that acquire in the group. And maybe I didn't explain it earlier enough, but essentially what happens is that people who have been victimized, they come to our group and they post about their experiences, whether their vehicle was stolen, their house was burglarized, uh, or they were robbed. They post about it, you know, they give us as much information as we can, as they can get. Uh, and that helps us to kind of track and help them you know, uh, either find the person responsible or, you know, maybe uh, find their stolen vehicle, their stolen property, uh, things of that nature. So by watching the trends, you can see, for example, when, you know, about a couple of years ago, Toyota Tacomas were getting hit nonstop uh, because they were getting their wow. wheels, uh, their rims stolen. That was something that we could see quite easily because it was just multiple posts after another. And of course, Facebook and, and social media in general is very powerful. So you can actually go and grab from Facebook, you can grab from Instagram, and you start seeing these trends, and that helps us to warn the public and say, "Listen, if you have one of these vehicles, you know it's being targeted right now." For example, so. Wow, were the um, in the Toyota uh, Tacoma instance, were the was this a, a small group? Did they ultimately get caught, or was it just a uh, something like broader? A whole bunch of different people wanted to have those types of wheels. Well, there's a lot of discussion on that. I mean, from the information that I do have, there are specific, like, uh, uh, you know, somebody will put a request out for a certain type of, you know, wheel, that sort of thing, and then, you know, somebody goes oh. and grabs it. You know, there's some people out there that, of course, that it's their job to steal, you know, and uh, they're in that. They wake up in the morning, and that's their job. They're going to go go out and steal specific things, and uh, that's kind of some of the things that we actually see. So, but I do know that, you know, a lot of the crime is, uh, when it comes to vehicle theft, is responsible just for a very small number of people uh, on the island. So, hmm, interesting. Are are stolen vehicles here just being stripped for parts? Or are they being shipped like like to the mainland and sold? Or do do you have any intel on that? Or are either one of you guys? I, I hear all kinds of things. Um, obviously, I get a lot of intel from other people. I mean, I get lots of sources that that message me or contact me, and you know, tell me about stuff, but. Really, I think a lot of the times it's it's a good mix. I mean, there is definitely vehicles that oh. disappear and you never see them again. But obviously, wow. there's also places like, you know, the chop shops, you know, that are out in the boonies, you know, and, and the cars disappear over there because they're just taken and then parted out. And, of course, the lucrative, yeah. there's a lucrative market for parts. Ah, I see. Yeah, they had a, uh, a, I just saw on the news recently, um, you know, up in Wahua by Whitmore Village, going over to that uh, Whitmore Naval Air Station, uh, they cleared out that brush, and there were a hundred something cars there. Uh, what? So, and God, God knows how many cases that they just closed from that. You know what I mean? I mean, these cars have been missing for years, and they were sitting right there in plain sight from the free or from uh, from Cam Highway. But because that grass was so tall, you had no idea that right on the other side of that tall grass. There's a hundred something cars sitting in the field. That's so the, uh, the, state is, uh, the state is working within itself to figure that kind of stuff out because that's like agricultural development land. And the oversight on that was poor. Mm, I see. It was extremely so, poor. In fact, it, it, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say it's something that actually came up in our group two years ago. Um, and, uh, with the focus on it, it hit the news, and then it hit the news again, and then it hit the news again, and and it was just one of these things for the past couple of years. That's been a known problem area, and they wouldn't take any action on it. And then w there was a female that got shot, you know, in the head, and, and unfortunately passed, and that drew a huge limelight to that area, and that's when everything hit. That's when they went after them. That pretty much was the breaking point for them. So, wow, for the you state to do something, basically. Yeah, you, you, you make a, a point that I've, I've often felt, and I don't know, I'd like to get you guys' opinion on it, but it seems to me that, that property crime, theft in particular, is not, not a high priority. Um, let's put it that way. And then violent crime, of course, you do something violent, they will find a bed for you some in one of these jails, right? Um, what's your feeling of, you know, the experience that you've seen over the years as, as, the, as that 
a valid uh, kind of sentiment, or do you think there's equal levels of activity for you know prop you know for investigating property theft as well as uh, violent crime? I think the issue with property crime is that um, it's often viewed as a you know non-traumatic, non-violent experience. But from my experience running the group, it's our bread and butter. Uh, violent crime, thankfully, is not a very high, it's not something that's extreme here compared to the mainland, but property yeah. crime is through the roof. And unfortunately, it is quite traumatic. You're talking about affecting about people's jobs, people lose their, get their cars stolen, you know, have their houses burglarized, that creates this trauma, they're afraid to sleep in their house at night. You know, there's a massive amount of, of property crime that affects people on a very high level. But for some reason, it's kind of relegated to the, you know, the lower end of the spectrum when, like, for example, our elected officials talked about it. You'll notice that in our, the elected officials' campaigns of that, they rarely talk about crime. Um, but yet mm -hmm. crime is horrible here. I think one of those things also has to do with the fact that property crime is hold, hard to solve without any distinct and um, uh, obvious amount of evidence. In other words, you need to have something mm -hmm. like, you know, clear video of the person doing it. You know, you need to have, you know, uh, just enough evidence to put them away. Otherwise, it won't be prosecuted. If it's not 100 percent open and shut case, the prosecutor's office usually doesn't take it just because, you know, they have so many cases on their hands. It's, it's impossible to, uh, to wow. go after every single Wow. One. Mike, I know when you were at um, the utility, I, you built some casework around some of this kind of stuff and provided evidence. Um, was that your experience as well, that you really had to have really good, detailed you know, technology, you might be a camera evidence or access control or whatever you may have had in order to get some some action taken against a, 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 a potential, I don't want to convict everybody, but a, a, a potential, um, what are they, a, a potential criminal. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Well, you know, we did feel that exactly what Mike was saying. And uh, one of the things we had to do is take the steps to work within the legislature to make trespassing and tampering with the uh, electrical utility a, uh, f uh, a felony. And that's what got mm -hmm. its attention. Uh, that just went into, uh, it passed uh, through the legislature just a couple of weeks ago, and it takes effect, I think, in like 2024, uh, something, something like that. And that's really what we had to do to get any kind of traction. It has to be, we had to increase the like, uh, severity of the crime, even though it's the same crime as it was yesterday, by making it a felony now, then it'll be actually investigated. Previous to that, we, we could have video, we could have analytics, we could have all kinds of data, and even with a face shot, and it didn't always go anywhere. Wow. You know, I um, I, I took a little bit of criminology back um, when I was in, in my undergrad studies, and I recall that they, back then, I mean, this is this is going way back now, late, late 80s, early 90s. The, uh, they said that 7% of the criminals did 70% of the crime. Um, is yep. that, would that resonate with you guys and your experience in the community here? I would have to say so. That is, uh, like I was saying about the vehicle crime, there's a certain segment of, of the population that really are responsible for it. And actually, and, and they just actually had a pretty successful case against one of them who was kind of the leader uh, and they took him out and that's actually sold some of the vehicle crime actually as of late. And there was a, a news in the, in the art, I mean, article in the news, you can go and look it up, but it did have an effect. And that's because of what you said, there's certain key people that have just basically, they have learned the system. They know, you know, how far they can push things and know the likelihood of them getting caught. A lot of the random crime that we see, you know, they are just single persons, but they're, you know, the ones that are really big, like where you can see vehicles getting, you know, stolen, you know, without much proof and evidence, that's usually behind, you know, somebody who does it for a living. Wow. And Mike, did you, I know because co copper theft was a big thing for a long time for utilities. Is that, did we have that happening over here as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, mm. It was, uh, it was a uh, weekly occurrence almost, you know, people risking their lives to, to steal a hundred dollars worth of copper. And when I was with the utility, what they would do is steal the, any kind of the uh, copper grounding or anything that you could reach from the outside of the perimeter fence. All the systems would detect them and we'd roll the police and they'd get there and either arrest them or chase them off. But that 50 to $100 worth of copper that they just stole, it cost that company uh, you know, upwards of $50,000 to replace because of all the things wow. that they have to do. Shut the substation, roll crews, roll trucks, do all these things. 
just to replace that, you know, 50 to 100 bucks worth of material that was taken. Man, that is something else. Um, we're gonna look at, okay, we're going to look at some of this data when we come back. We got to pay some bills. So we'll take a break for one minute and we'll be right back with Michael Kitchens and Michael Gonzalez. Thanks, guys. Hang around. Aloha, my name is Duration. I am the host of Finding Our Future here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm here every other Tuesday from 1 to 1.30 p.m. Here on this show, um, I cover issues around sustainability, um, you know, global issues that matter for young people, for future generations, and other social justice issues. So please join us. It's live streamed on Think Tech Hawaii and also uploaded on YouTube. Hey, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Corona Crimes. This is a special edition today. We're we're chopping up this this issue of crime in Hawaii and trying to see if it had a, if the Corona uh, um, uh, quarantine not not really quarantine here, but the, the the shelter in place orders have had an effect on crime. And we've been talking a little bit about you know what crime's been going on, and it seems like property crimes kind of rampant in Hawaii. And you know if you do some some if you're really bad and do some violent things, then probably they'll put you away. But um, the, the crime scene is big. Uh, Michael Kitchens is with us today. He has um, stolen stuff away. I've uh, got a great community of folks out there. So if you have some problems, make sure you go find him and post out there. You never know what kind of help you might get. Mike Gonzalez is here with us. He spent a lot of time helping a, a, one of our large utilities manage uh, crime against their facilities and keep them secure. So um, Mike, I know you got some, some of the CAP index data from Honolulu. Why don't you explain the, what the CAP is and then maybe we'll take a look at some of that six mile data that we, that we have today. Okay, so what the CAP index data does, as I mentioned before, is it uh, it consumes all that uniform crime reporting data from the FBI and puts it in a geospatial tool, which will lay that out on where the crime occurred, and we can run statistics on when it happened and um, how that compares to the national average. And it takes things into account like population density and things like that. So it takes it takes away some of that. Uh, some of those gaps that you might see uh, between the comparison of, you know, a city like Honolulu and a city like Chicago um, or, or L.A. or New York, it'll it'll uh, adjust those numbers for things like that. And as you can see here, I believe that's 275 or 245. What that means, that score, that means that in this six mile methodology where I ran the report and I just centered it under on Sand Island uh, for the purposes of this of this uh, presentation, just so it would catch most of downtown, downtown Honolulu and Kalihi and all that. Um, what that's showing is that uh, the crime in Honolulu in this area is 2.45 times the national average for um, for cities of our population density and size. So that's wow. interesting. And that supports exactly what Mike was saying, where, where um, property crime is kind of a, a big deal here. And it's not seen as being as big of a deal as we see it because it's not sh it's not understood to be as traumatic as, as uh, an experience of like getting assaulted or something to that effect. But when you come into somebody's house and you violate their space, I mean, that has a severe traumatic impact on everybody I've spoken to. And the same thing applies in their car, right? I mean, we have an expectation of privacy. And when somebody invades that, regardless of what location they're doing it in, whether it's your home, your business, your car, whatever, you feel that and it matters to you. And, you know, there's a lot of things that could be affecting that. Like for one example, I know I just saw the chief on the news uh, several months ago talking about um, their staffing issues with the police department and that they were going to forego investigations on various different low-level crimes uh, and focus on some of the more important stuff in their view. And that could have a negative impact on, you know, on how much crime is going on because people see that as like, hey, that risk, that risk reward calculation that they're doing in their mm. head, I put the scale, right? So one of the things that I was thinking about um, when it comes to coronavirus and how it affects 
all of this is that, as you mentioned before, somewhere between two and a half and 10% of the population commit 100% of the crimes. And in Hawaii, we have a very high cost of living and we have a high homeless population. And that fringe, you know, the 10 to 20% fringe right there, they might be uh, tempted to turn to crime in these sorts of times because they may, may, may not be an essential worker. They may not be able to work from home. They might not be able to work at all. They're looking to not become homeless if they're not homeless right now. They got to pay their rent. Any money they have is going towards that. So the temptation is there to break the law. Now, usually we have an insane amount of tourists here. And I don't know if you all have seen the, the pictures of the Aloha, Aloha Stadium where the entire stadium parking lot is full of rental cars that are no longer on the road. That blew my mind because it puts a, it, I, I, I understood the numbers, but I didn't understand the severity until I saw that. And so what's interesting to me is that before, when it came to property crime, people would go after tourists and do uh, UEMVs, you know, car break-ins for rental cars, because they understood that if I break into this car, even if I get caught, the chances of this person coming all the way back to Hawaii to testify against me is slim to none. So that's nothing's mm -hmm. going to happen to me. Now, last this last week, only 800 something tourists came into Hawaii because of the governor's, you know, basically wow. stay home. So these people still got to do what they got to do. As Mike mentioned, stealing is their job. So mm. the people they're going to go after is us now. You know what I mean? So it's not, I'm not trying to like uh, create fear or anything like that. You know, it's, it's, I'm just saying awareness, right? Everybody's thinking about how do I take care of my home? How do I take care of my family? How do I protect myself from this unseen threat? We need to start thinking about seen threats too. This is the time where mm. it's important, you know, make sure that wow. you and what's going on in your neighborhood and you understand who's snooping around. Yeah, Mike Kitchens, does that resonate? Are you, are you seeing more crime? Are you seeing less crime? How's it looking? I did notice that the piggyback on what um, Mike said uh, is that we actually just had a couple of days ago, we had an actual burglary, uh, a robbery pretty much at one o'clock in the, in the afternoon in someone's house. You know, they left their door open, they came in, you know, robbed them, you know, at gunpoint and then left. You know, and that just goes to see you know, that is something that I, I don't see very often in the group, you know, but to have somebody actually be so brazen enough that they go into somebody's home during the middle of the day and rob them. Mm -hmm. That's a huge change. You know, that, that's a that issue right? that we have. Yeah. Mm, and uh, one of the other things that happening as well is that uh, they're now releasing inmates. They're releasing mm -hmm. inmates from the jails, uh, you know, misdemeanor crimes, but also felons who have committed, you know, a probation violation. So you could have somebody that, you know, went on a rampage, stole a bunch of vehicles, you know, and then, um, you know, did a lot of property crime. And now they just got released because they violated the probation as opposed to the fact that, you know, they, they're not just, it's not, that's not a misdemeanor. They're a felon. And now because yeah. they're releasing inmate because of the COVID virus, those guys are now on the wow. streets, you know, uh, um, able and you know yeah they say that they're either they have to have a place to go before they get released they either have to be in rehab home or something like that but you know what i mean that that doesn't mean that they're staying in those places so yeah mm. it's different i think this is something we might need to keep uh kind of keep maybe a two-week check-in on this kind of an episode to kind of keep up and keep to keep the public abreast of what's kind of going on um i know you brought some february and and uh march uh, cat data as well. Let's take a look at that because I thought it was interesting that the the days of the week that the crime was happening changed. I think that's February and looks like Thursday was the biggest crime day in, uh, of the week. And then yep. I don't know, Eric, if you can flip that to March. Now look at March, Sunday and Monday. So I anybody got an idea why that might be happening? So. This uh, this data that uh, that we're showing right there is from the Honolulu Police Department crime mapping website. So the, you can get oh, okay. up to the minute information from uh, the first one was Cap Index. This this last one was uh, CrimeMapping.com or something. It's a link from uh, from the HPD website. If you look at Crime Stats or Crime Mapping, the tab on there, and you can do filtering and 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 zone in on your particular neighborhood, right? So that representation, that's just showing basically the same representation as the cap index data, like central, uh, like downtown and like three miles around downtown. And you'll notice that those days of the week did flip, you know, the, the Thursday. I mean, I think it stands to reason that before the coronavirus thing was a problem, 
on Thursdays and Fridays, they might be uh, taking things to gear up for the, you know, party favors for the weekend or whatever their habit is, you know, feeding their habit or doing whatever they're doing. And then yeah. when it flips to Sunday and Monday, it looks like more toward, it looks to me like it's more of necessity, right? It's like getting money to make sure you can eat and do those sorts of things. I mean, that's just speculation, but it stands to reason. And why I say that is that in addition to the crime that Mike was reporting um, in the middle of the afternoon at one o'clock, uh, when everybody knows that most people are home and there's a good chance of encountering somebody. On top of that, the Hawaii Food Bank just had a break in where people stole a bunch of stuff from the Hawaii Food Bank in the, in the past week. Wow! So that is a that is a sign that there is serious desperation there. And one of the points that I wanted to make, and you know, I'll say it again in closing. Uh, at the end of this is that, you know, we need to be aware of what's going on in our neighborhood and we need to be able to protect each other. But equally important, I think, is that we need to have compassion for the people that are committing these crimes and not saying open your door and let them steal. But it's on all of us to help each other. Right. And if we can help solve a problem and, and have and have people not turn to these sorts of violations, you know, of people's personal space and and income and everything like that, we might be able to help ourselves. Nice. It's, we could definitely use more compassion right now. Mike Kitchens, your final thoughts? Well, I, I believe that, you know, the fact that everybody's at home right now, uh, there's a large majority of people that are at home. Um, and because of the uncertainty of, of the virus, I, I'm hoping that crime will maybe improve. However, the fact that, you know, there are people are losing their jobs, you know, they're losing their employment and employment, you know, unemployment is, is record highs. I don't foresee that happening. I see it possibly getting maybe a little bit worse, not not to be fear mongering, but I just think that we really need to be aware. Uh, we need to be vigilant and we need to make sure that, you know, we're watching out for each other and we're taking care of each other. And most importantly, you know, as soon as something happens, you've got to pick up the phone and you got to call 911. It's not call social media. It's not go on social media. It's not, uh, you know, tell your friends. It's, you know, call 911. Um, yeah, and of course, call protect the police, yourself please. as well. Yeah, thank you. Guys, thank you so much. Um, we may gear up another one of these in a few weeks and see how we're doing. I think this is good, good information for the community. And I really appreciate you taking the time to share today. Out there, everybody, you guys be safe, stay indoors. Um, be healthy. Aloha, everyone. Take care. Thanks now.